So this is the time when we usually have our prayer partners come up and pray for you guys and the needs that you have. But I woke up this morning and my heart's been hurting for several weeks now. We've had some loss in the church. We've had some people that have passed away and some people that had their life taken. And it just reminds me of how close we are to the coming of Christ. Yes. And that we don't know the time or the hour that he's coming, but can I tell you, we don't know the time or the hour when we're leaving. We had a young man that yesterday morning had his life taken and I had the opportunity a couple weeks ago just to share the gospel with him we don't know we don't know when we may leave so we're still going to have prayer time this morning during this third song but here's what I'm going to ask every one of us knows somebody that needs something. Whether that's healing, whether that's salvation, whether that's just redemption, we have somebody in our life that needs something from God. And I know you came this morning because you probably need something from God today too. But can I tell you when we focus on what God focuses on, He just gives us what we need. So here's what I'm going to ask this morning. There's somebody God placed in your mind when I started talking this morning. So what I want to do is I want us to intercede for them during this third song. And here's what I want to do. We have a whole lot of room up here. You don't have to come in front of the stage. You can come on the sides. But I want us to come to the altar this morning. You know, in Ezekiel, it says that God looked for someone to stand in the gap for Israel that they may, and he says they couldn't find anybody. I don't want God to look at Connect Church and say, I couldn't find anybody to stand in the gap. I couldn't find anybody that would reach to earth and reach to heaven and be the person in between. I want God to always look at Connect Church as they'll stand in the gap for the people that they love. They'll stand in for the gap for the people they don't even know. So forget about your problems this morning. If you're like, Pastor, I don't know who I would pray for. I've got a friend named Rob who lost his wife two weeks ago. and we, we, we laid her to rest Monday morning. Pray for Rob. I've got a family that's going to bury their son this week. Pray for them. We have Israel who is being attacked and Can I tell you, the last days are getting closer when that happens, y'all. Pray for Israel. We have a new series starting next week called Church Church. And can I tell you, there's a lot of people that need healing from that. Pray for them. So there's always somebody to pray for, but we got to focus on what God focuses on. Amen? So what I want this morning as they start this third song, I'm going to be down here praying for Rob and for Chris and Nicole this morning. And you come pray for who God has on your heart. I'm only asking for five minutes to focus on somebody else this morning instead of focusing on our problems. Let's, let's stand in the gap for somebody this morning that needs something from God. So come on up this morning and let's stand in the gap this morning together. We're so glad you're here. Hey, if we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Mike. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Connect Church, and I just love that you're joining us. Hey, just a couple quick announcements. First, if you're new to Connect, we just want to say welcome to the family. We truly believe that church is a family. Hey, if you are new here, I would love for you to do one of two things. You get two choices. You got one or two. Here we go. Number one, you can you text new to Connect to 97000 or go to our new here booth and let one of my uh, amazing volunteers sort of connect with you, sort of hear your story. We would just love to get to know you better and see how we can serve you better. A couple of great announcements we also have is number one is it's never too late to join a connect group. 
We really are passionate about creating a big church into a small church. Because when you do that, it becomes your church. You get to know the people around you, fellowship with people around you, share your story with people around you. Hey, it's never ever too late to join a connect group. Also, we have uh, this coming Wednesday, so the 18th, October 18th, our students are going to Fields of Faith. Hey, if you have a teenager or even a junior higher, you need to get them to Shotwell Stadium by 5.30 and look for our associate pastors, our student pastors, myself. You need to look for us because we're going to have a little tailgating. We're going to have a great time. But it's going to be an amazing time. We're close to 5,000 students come together and worship God in one place. It's going to be an amazing, amazing event. If you have any questions, go contact Jules or Jordan White, our student pastors. Lastly, we have an amazing upcoming series coming. Uh, it's called Church Hurt. Everyone has been hurt by someone or something in the church. And I'm telling you that it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be an amazing, amazing series as we walk through, as we process the pain of church hurt together as a family. Pastor Adam has an amazing, amazing series planned for all of us, and I cannot wait. Join us October 22nd for this amazing, amazing series. Now, if you would join me in, in welcoming our uh our pastor of the day, our worship, no, he's not our worship pastor, that's weird. He is our discipleship pastor. He is the man, the myth, the legend, our pastor, our XP, our executive pastor. I'm trying to drum up. He's an amazing guy. He has an amazing word for us today. Uh, join me in welcoming our executive pastor, Pastor Roger Jackson. Well, good morning, guys, Net Church. Glad you guys are here. Um, Pastor Mike, uh, that was very gracious of you uh, trying to build that up, man. That was awesome. Uh, just want to say, uh, as you guys know, my name is Pastor Roger. I'm happy to be here this morning with you guys. And uh, I just want to give a special thanks to Pastor Adam for giving me the opportunity to, to share God's word with you this morning. And so as, as many of you guys know, over the last, uh, we've been here for five years. We celebrated our five-year mark last month with a ton of baptisms and celebrations, amen. Yeah, I mean, God is moving big time in this place, and I'm excited about what he's doing. And today, I felt led uh, to talk with you about what makes a healthy, life-giving church. Because, uh, I, and, and the reason I want to talk about that is because I, it's not that I don't think we're healthy. I just don't want the enemy to try to derail us from what God is trying to do in this place. And I, and I can tell you, as a Christian leader, man, there, it, is, uh, it is crazy what the enemy is doing, how he's going after the church, how he is trying to take out the church. And, it, and, it, and he's going to do whatever he can. But there's some good news. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says this, Now I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. And the good news is this, guys, is that there's going to be, if we're doing the work of the ministry, if we're, as a church, if we're going after the things of God, the enemy is going to be pounding at our gates constantly. But the good news is this, if we stay Christ-centered and make this about Jesus and his kingdom, man, they will not prevail. The enemy will not prevail at destroying this church or churches around us. And, and God has something for us this morning. And so there's three things that uh, I think that produce a healthy, life-giving church. And the first one is this. We individually need to understand our roles and responsibilities. Second, we collectively lead with a servant's heart that promotes unity and kills jealousy, gossip, and personal offense. And then number three, we must follow the biblical model of a healthy church. And so uh, putting together this message, I realized there's a lot of information. We could actually break this up into three different weeks, really, with the, with the topics here today. Uh, but I felt from the Lord that I was supposed to at least touch on those first two. And then in, uh, in, on number three, we must follow a biblical model. That's something that is going to be the bulk of the message. We'll be coming out of Acts chapter two for that part. And so anyways, I just want to point your attention uh, to what God's going to be doing in our church. And, and so the first point is this, understanding our roles and responsibilities. It's imperative that you understand uh, you make up the church. Do you realize that? It's not this building that makes the church, even though it has the name church on it. 
It's not the pastoral staff or those who are paid or who you see up on stage. No, it's all of us collectively making the body of Christ. He's called all of us. And after you accept Christ, there's a calling uh, for us to be a part of what God is doing. And you have a unique call and a specific gift that God has given to you directly. And see, there's natural gifts. There's things that you just carry from your personal life, from your business world, or, or wherever you come from. Um, maybe, maybe you can sing really good. Whatever it is, there's this natural natural abilities that God gives you, but there's also something called spiritual abilities or spiritual gifts that God gives you that's unique uh, to the church that you are called to specifically. And you can only find those gifts uh, and those abilities if we press into God. You have to press into God. You have to know God, and you have to press into him, and then ask him for those gifts, and God will start revealing what those gifts are. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, we're going to read this, and I'm going to point out a couple of things about verse 7 and 11, but let, let's read the whole thing, and then we'll break it apart real quick. Now, to each one of you, uh, or to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To, uh, to one, there is given the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, and to another miraculous powers, and to another prophecy and distinguishing between the spirits, uh, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of the tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. And so if we pause real quick and look at verse 7, verse 7 is talking about the gifts are given to encourage the church and the mission of the church, okay? That's what it's talking about, the common good, the manifestation of, of the spirit is given for the common good. And the common good is for the works that we are doing as the church. And then verse 11, this is the key, guys. Uh, and, and one of the things I come across a lot of times is people People take uh, spiritual gift tests, and there's nothing wrong with them. Like, but but a lot of times it's kind of targeted at a personality test type type mentality. But this is what I want you to catch right here in verse 11. Uh, it says that all these uh, all these works are one Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. It is God who gives you literally a special ability that is unique to the church or abilities, and He calls you and He wants to manifest that out of your life so that you can do the things that He's called you uniquely to do. And and we have to understand that God desires and wants you to understand your gifts, which in return will inform you as a believer, this is my role in the church. Now I understand, right? So many Christians uh, nowadays, this is what they strongly believe. And, and, and it's kind of throughout the United States, this is a pretty common theme. Um, most attendees will come and they believe, well, my, my, my role is to support the church uh, by, and I'll support the pastor and I'll do that through financially. I'll, give, uh, I'll be praying for him and I'll, I'll be attending, right? And, and, and then the pastor and the paid staff, they're actually the ones that called to go do the work of the ministry. They're the ones who are going to go do everything that we need you to do. And so uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't know how to view your role in the church, you are missing a critical piece of what God has called you to. You have to know your role. You have to. And, and, and let me tell you the beauty behind this is that, that God has actually called you and I, both you and I, doesn't matter who you are, if you are a Christ follower, you are called to actually go do the work of the ministry. And Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says this, so uh, Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, now get this, verse 12, uh, to equip the people uh, for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Guys, Pastor Adam can only do so much. He's only going to have so much influence. He's only going to have so many people he knows. Uh, when we collectively go together and we start being ignited by the Spirit to go do the work of the ministry, and, and we realize that God's given us pockets of influence and, and the people that we are supposed to be called to, to minister to, and, and what happens is that we, we, we have fear inside of us because we don't know how to talk about God. But God, let me tell you what, God will show up in a miraculous way through the power of the Holy Spirit to encourage you, to give you the gifts, to give you the things that you need to speak to those people. And guys, the message of the gospel is simple. Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. And that's, all, and that's, and that's what we're proclaiming. And we're trying to help them towards that. 
you are a vital, uh, you are a vital piece to the church's success. And I, I really want you to get this. You could be, guys, there's so many different areas of ministry that are in this church right now that we need help in. Uh, children's ministry, guest services. Uh, we're trying to start missions, outreach uh, going on, coming up soon. Uh, we got small groups. I mean, there's so many different areas. You could be the missing link that will take this church to the next level. All right, you guys hear that? And serving and understanding your role is a major piece to your own spiritual growth and as well as uh, into your uh, own spiritual life. And you're going to see God start using you. And you're going to, you know, what happens is that we go to church and we attend and we have a relationship with God. And we're like, God, I still feel like something's missing. I still feel like something's missing. And what's missing is that we are not actively engaged into the work that God's called us to. He's called us to be actively engaged. And so I want to leave you with this question before we go to point two. This is your church. What role has God called you to be involved in? What role has God called you to be involved in? Second point for today. Uh, this, is a, this is a mouthful, but uh, we'll, we'll break it up and we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, we collectively lead with a servant's heart that promotes unity, kills jealousy, uh, gossip, and personal offense. Our attitude about ourselves, about others, and about our church matters. And, um, and if you look around this room, there is a ton of different personalities represented here. You got some who are A-type, like, man, that row is jacked up, and I got to go fix that chair, and I mean, that's going to drive me nuts the whole service. Like, I'm going to be looking at that chair the whole time because it's not perfectly in order. And then you got other people who walk in and are like, man, it's just a nice fall day. Like, I'm just really loving this. It's, like, it's good out here. And, and then you got people that fall in between. But what you guys, you got a, a mix of so many different types of personalities. And the reason I'm pointing this out in, in, about these personality types and, and who we are is eventually everyone starts creating an opinion about their church. And so two things usually happen. The first thing is this. Uh, there will be things that you love about your church. And these are things that you tell your family and friends about when you're inviting someone over, you know, to, to come to the church. He's like, man, I love the worship. I love, I love Pastor Adam and his style and the way he dresses. I love Pastor Mike and his goofiness. You know, it's like, you know, you love those things. And it's the things that, that you're like, man, this is really my home church, man. I love it. But then there's things that you think that could be better, that you can make better, right? Uh, or things that you think we just don't do very good at all. Now, I would tell you, opinions are not a bad thing. In fact, they help, they help us to improve the church's processes and function of the church. It can be a very good thing. But let me tell you the key to it. You have to have the right heart behind it. You have to have the right heart. If you do not have the right heart, let me tell you what happens. When opinions are not properly governed, they will turn into a critical spirit. And the danger of the critical spirit is this, that once that monster is formed inside of your mind to roam free, to do whatever it wants, it starts to devour everything that you see and everything you touch. And, and it's a snowball effect. And it's crazy how, how it happens. The enemy will use your opinions with your sinful nature, because we all have sinful natures, even though that we're redeemed by Christ, we still have a sinful nature we battle against. And those two things will come collectively together and form a weapon that will destroy not only you, but those in the church. It's huge. Like, we've got to get this as the body in Christ. And I'm not saying this because I'm seeing this around us. I'm just saying let's be aware of this, right? And so this is how it starts off. And let me, let me kind of start uh, laying this out for you. You will first find a new problem. And, I, I, you know, and then one problem turns into two problems, then three problems. And then all of a sudden it starts snowball, right? That snowball effect. And let me give you some examples. Well, I don't like the way he said that. I don't like the way he said that. And then, and then, and then maybe someone else says, well, why does she get to do that? But I've been here longer. And what starts forming is jealousy, right? Jealousy starts forming. And then, and then another will say, I, I asked, you know, Pastor Mike or Roger or, or Pastor Adam to change this. And I can say, just really don't care about my opinion. And then an offense takes place, right? And those problems will become so big eventually to you that you start voicing your opinions because you're not in the right heart. You'll start voicing those opinions to those around you. And what that's called is called gossip. And check this out. This is the last piece of it. You will try to turn people on your side to make sure that you, you're, you're not missing it. Like, I want to, hey, hey, uh, you know, Crystal, did you, did you see, you see how the way they handle it? Because I, did you see that too? Yeah, I saw that. And what happens there, you start, you start trying to draw people on your side, you're starting to divide the church. You start dividing the church. 
and it's a nasty, and this is, and eventually what happens is you just, you, uh, what the enemy will do is the enemy destroys your love for the church that you once called home. And that cycle will continue from every church that you go to until it is dealt with, until you deal with that critical monster, that critical spirit that rises up inside of us. This is why we have to fight for unity. You are not fighting against, you are not fighting against, for unity against others. We are fighting against unity against yourself to remain whole, to remain unified, to remain humble, to remain as a servant for the Lord. It's not about us when it comes to the church. It's about the glory of God. And Romans 12, 3 says this, for by the grace given uh, me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each one of you. Now, the key word here is in verse 3 is this idea of sober judgment, right? Sober judgment, and this is just my translation of sober judgment, it's having self-awareness and clarity of one's motives and intentions within their heart. And I'm going to say that one more time. Uh, sober judgment is having self-awareness and clarity of one's motives and attentions within their heart. And so to guard against a critical spirit, uh, there's actually a very easy way to defend ourselves. It, it's way more practical than you might think it would be. We have to have the Holy Spirit consistently active inside of us and, and praying through this. And that what he does is he starts turning our heart more about ourselves, more into the, to the servant heart, to love others, to, to place others above ourselves. And, and the God will start working in that, but this is how you have to govern it. You govern it through listening to the Holy Spirit, to what he's teaching you. You have to govern it through prayer. You have to govern it through the word of God, and he starts shaping and molding that. And in fact, my, uh, Jesus modeled this very thing of a servant heart. And so let, let me read this to you. Matthew 20, 28 says this, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. Uh, here, and what I want to share with you is just a couple of attributes, list a couple attributes for you that, that explain the servant's heart. Compassion, love, selflessness, empathy, humility, patience, generosity, kindness, responsibility, dependability, flexible, gratitude, graciousness, trusted. Now, I'm sure there could be a lot more that we can list there, but you guys get the point of what this is going after. And so as we're shaping this, and I want to point some more verses out about unity, about thinking about this thing, about tying it together for us so we understand as a church what to do. And so Ephesians 4, uh, 3 says this, make every effort, 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 effort to keep the unity of the spirit uh, through the bond of peace. Every effort, like not just a little bit, not just with everything inside of you. Guys, our opinions, our sinful natures drive us to self, being selfish. We have to fight against that. Then we make, uh, and then in Philippians uh, 2, 2 through 3, it says this, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. And guys, get this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. It's about, guys, it's about looking at this and seeing it. This is about other people. This is, this is for the glory of God. This is something bigger than yourself. We can't get tied in being all about ourselves. It's bigger than us. It's for his glory. And then 1 Peter 3, 8 says this, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic to one another, and be compassionate and humble. Friends, we must collectively lead with a servant heart that promotes unity, kills jealousy, gossip, and personal offense. Amen? Number three, and this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through, I'm going to read actually Acts 2, 42 through 47, and then what we're going to do is we're going to piece it out one by one and kind of understand what that scripture is talking about, okay? And so Acts 2, 42 through 47 says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all the believers were gathered together, having everything in common. They sold their property and their possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their home and ate together with glad, glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Man, this verse right here, guys, has a profound impact on generations of Christians. 
If you go through history and you study denominations, the history of how Christian denominations were formed and the movements of, of, of Christian uh, ministries, you will find that every move, new movement at, of their time that, that was existing, of their day, I mean, uh, you'll see that there's this drawing to go back to this Acts chapter 2 movement. We want to be like the original church. We want to be like the early church. And even today, if you talk to Christian thought leaders, pastors, or, or anybody that's in the Christian world, uh, there's a major sense that in America, we are missing the mark as Christians, as the church. And this is something I even sensed back in 2016 and, and even in January of this year, before I, me and Crystal started coming to Connect Church, this is something I sat down with Pastor Adam with, and we talked about it. And, and I, said, I said, Pastor Adam, I said, there's just something missing, but I can't put my finger on it. I can't. And guys, let me tell you, it almost stopped me from wanting to come to church in my life. If I could be real with you, it's amazing I'm standing up here right now. Like, I was at a place literally 10 months ago where I was like, I just don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. We're, we're missing it. And, I, and I, my heart was broken, and God was doing some things inside of me too, but there was just this, there was just something missing. And so, uh, and this isn't to be funny, but when we started coming to Connect Church, it was like God started to rearrange, rearrange the pieces back in my life to show me what the church is all about. And, and a credit goes to Pastor Adam and Pastor Mike for what they have developed here, what they're going after. And I de- identified three things this year I want to share with you really quickly, and then we'll go and break down the verses real quick, okay? So the first one is God's presence. God's presence, not performance, okay? And, and what, in January, and this is what I'll share with you guys, in January when we came, the first thing that we ever did with Connect Church was come to a night of worship. And that night of worship, Crystal got to sing with the, with the band. And there was like 20, 25 people. I mean, it wasn't like a crazy group of people there. But man, like I tell you, I was sitting there and I was reading my Bible and I was just worshiping too at the same time. And I just thought like, huh, when's the last time we've slowed down just to give God time? And, and, and let, me, let me point out something else too. You guys have been in services. If you've been here long enough, there's been times where Pastor Adam says, you know, guys, we're just gonna pray. We're just gonna slow down this service. And you know why he's doing that? Because he, he values the presence of God above everything else because he knows what the presence of God will do. It will transform lives. And so he, we slow down, and I'm, I'm grateful to be in a house that, that values the presence of God. The second thing, and, and I'm sorry to always pick on you, Pastor Adam, but, this is, but, but the other thing was Pastor Adam came back in May, and something happened in him. And he, he was listening to a message by John Brevere, and he got a book called All of God, and, and, and what that did is Pastor Adam brought back this idea of like, guys, we haven't feared the Lord. Like we stopped fearing God. It was a prophetic, timely message, not only just to him, to this church, but to myself. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, dude, I, I, and what it did is it immediately brought me back to my early years of following Jesus and what it was all about. And I remember it's not this fear like God can crush me in a second, because he could, he could if he wanted to. But the reality is that I, I, I feared being away from God. I love God so much that I wanted to be in his presence that I, I was afraid to miss out on what God had for me. Like, I want you, God. And somehow along the, lay, along, along the way, I matured and became too confident in my own self-decision-making. And I pushed God out of the way. And then the third one is this, man. This, one's the, this one hits the heart for me. The church exists to worship God, not people. And, and so many years, I've been in ministry, I've been student ministry, campus pastor, I've done all these different things, and, and it's just crazy that we got into a place where we're so worried about entertaining people that we miss it's all about him in the first place. It's all about him. And guys, I, I can tell you right now that uh, God, God, you know, don't get me wrong, the, the church is about people coming together. It, it, you're supposed to feel encouraged, inspired, but man, there's something bigger that happens within that. And we have to realize, we have to get back, and, and we need to repent as the, the American church, as churches across the world. Like, guys, if we focus on God, everything else will be taken care of. Like God will just add. Things will just happen. It's, it's seriously that simple. And so I wanted to share those real quick, because as we dive into Acts 2, 42, we're going to break apart this stuff, and I'm going to go as quickly as, po- as possibly as I can, so, uh, but bear with me. So Acts 2, 42 says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Now, the key word here is uh, uh, they devoted in an apostles' teachings, right? And so devoted means in a very loving or loyal, uh, loyal uh, to something or someone. So what this means is that they were loyal to the scripture, 
They had letters to the church that eventually would become the New Testament, right? They didn't have pocket Bibles laying around. They couldn't go to the Christian bookstore down the road in the Roman road, uh, you know, like, hey, can I go grab a Bible? Like that didn't exist back then. But they had letters that they wrote and, and, they, had, and they shared these letters and, and eventually that would become the New Testament. And these letters were the teachings of Jesus and the guidelines to the Christian life. And they were also using the Old Testament to kind of like see how prophecy lined up and how these things were all coming together. And devotion to the early church was not just this idea of showing up and listening to the meetings. Devotion to them was putting into practice what was being taught. And the early church understood that devotion meant commitment to the scriptures. The, uh, and this follows exactly what Jesus commanded in Matthew 28. Uh, 20, and it says this, and, the, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. You see, Jesus said, please teach them what I'm telling you. And that's exactly what you see the early church doing. They went by Jesus' words, and they went by what the Old Testament is talking about, and they tied those things together, and they were committed to those things. And right now in America, as you heard me say, there is a major attack on the Bible. There's a major attack on our Christian faith. And the primary way this is happening is through culture pre uh, cultural pressure. Culture is not just attacking one or two aspects of the Bible. They're going after the integrity of the Bible and the Christian faith. And one of the primary ways this is happening is that culture is trying to dilute truth. And one of the ways they do that, um, it, it, you know, and the, one of the ways they go about doing that is that truth is now, it could be whatever you want it to be, right? There's no absolutes. You know, if you think about, if you feel a certain way, well, that's truth. You know, if you want to do this, you want to do that, there are no bounds to, to what you are, to what you believe, to what you think. I mean, you can go on the internet and all of a sudden, well, that's truth, and have no verification for it, right? And so um, what's, what's redefining this truth in our American culture is this idea of tolerance. And tolerance says it's the ability or willingness to tolerate something, in particular, the existence of opinions or behaviors that one does not necessarily agree with. But what's happening is that tolerance is shifting to something more hostile. And this is the mindset. If you don't see it from my point of view, then you're against me. Like this middle ground, the neutral ground within this idea of culture and belief systems and worldviews are, are coming to an head. And there's not neutral ground anymore. It's becoming hostile. And so why am I, why am I sharing this with you as, as the body of Christ? Well, if you believe, just like I believe, we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, this means that Jesus Christ is literally the only way to heaven. And we know this because John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered them, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in our belief, there are no other opinions or options about it. There's none. And he is the only way. And so what does this mean for the Christian? What does this mean for the Christian? In our society, this automatically starts pushing the bucket, us into the bucket of non-tolerance. And now every Christian's non-tolerant. And in the current American culture, Christians are the following. They're judgmental. They're hypocrites. They're closed-minded. And we get labeled this based on a few extreme groups that are out there. There's some people, guys, who try to come in the name of Jesus that are just not about Jesus. They come with hate. They do not see people through the lens of Jesus. But we also get labeled that because we as believers do believe in an absolute truth. And, you, and, and because you believe in the Bible and because you believe Jesus is the only way, it start, all of a sudden starts pushing us in that bucket. And for the Christ follower, the Bible is the standard of our faith. It's God's word, period. And we believe the, uh, the Bible is the word of God. And as you guys know, the Bible is a big book. It's got a ton of things. It, talk, it talks about, it shapes us, it guards our lives. And at times, it makes us feel very uncomfortable because this is why. Because it starts pointing out unholy things and toxic things in our lives. Some examples of this is what, what the Bible teaches is who is God and how he created us. What pleases God, what doesn't please God. It teaches us about relationships and sexuality. It teaches us how to worship God. It reveals a lot about the sinful nature and how to overcome. It reveals the enemy and how he attacks us. It teaches us about emotional and mental health. Friends, the Bible literally talks about every single aspect of your life, period. It talks about everything. And that is why Christianity is so controversial in the world, because the Bible really does proclaim one God and one way to live. But that way can only be found through relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And as I stand here today as a testimony to say, man, guys, I have, I have been, if you're faithful to the Holy Spirit in your life, if you're faithful to the word of God, you will see a life that, that Jesus promises in 10, 10, uh, John 10, 10. It says, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. That is so true. I desire nothing of this world but to live for Jesus because I've seen God's hand and his provisions and his blessing over my family and over my life. And I, and I, I stand here to tell you, tell you, like, I don't understand how people live without God. Like, it's, it's amazing to me. It's so, it's got to be so terrible to not have Christ in your life because it's like, man, he's the one that is the glue. He holds me together. He places me together. And I'm so grateful for that. But to see this full expression of God lived out in our lives, uh, there is one word that will make and break this. You can, can you guess what that word is? Commitment. Commitment. We must be committed to the entire word of God and committed to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We cannot play this game of picking and choosing what to believe out of the Bible. When we start to pick and choose what we believe out of the Bible, we become God. And let me tell you the danger. We become judge who knows, we become judge, we know what's right and wrong right? We start forming our own religion, basically, at that point. And this is dangerous because this gives way to the sinful nature to tell us what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. When you have a corrupt soul inside of you and a mind and a body, how can you know what is pure and holy without a holy God revealing those things to you? And so God's word and his guidance will rub us the wrong way a lot because of our sinful nature. There might be some in here today that really need to hear hear this, but guys, friends, it kills the Holy Spirit's power in your life when you start picking and choosing. It kills your faith. It kills your spiritual growth. And let me just say this. If you say, God, I will give you everything, but just that one thing in my life, oh, that's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. Be aware. And a great great question for all of us today, myself included, okay? I'm not perfect. I'm very far from perfect. But, But you have to ask yourself the question, What area or areas are you not giving to God today? As believers, as non-believers, maybe maybe never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But what areas are you holding on to that God says, I want that? You want to see the next level of your spiritual life take off? You've got to give me that. If you're not willing to give me that, I can only do so much in your life. But if we give that to him, watch the full expression of God's love and his mercy and his grace and his provisions and his guidance in your life really come out in a major way. And so that is what we have to do. Let's be a people who are devoted to the entire word of God. And so I make this point, a healthy life-giving church is one that is devoted and loyal to the word of God. Acts 2, 42, the second half. Sorry, bear with me. It's not going to be that long on everyone. Uh, and, and it says this, uh, and so and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So it's talking about the church gathering together, doing things. Uh, Healthy churches do life together, right? Uh, Life is too short to place yourself around meaningless conversations and people who are focused on themselves and things of the things of this world, right? Life is too short. Uh, The three things that the early church did really well within fellowship is they did things outside of the church, they gathered together. For us, that would be the equivalent to go watching a football game at somebody's house or coming over and, and just hanging out and having fun, maybe going to watch a movie together, right? Like they did life together. It wasn't something that was forced. It was genuine. It was something that was real genuine in their lives, and they saw that kind of come together. Uh, the second thing is they ate together. Now, this is where I'm going to pause and share a very funny story. Well, to me, it was a very funny story, but it's about my boy, Ray. Uh, Ray uh, started coming to this church uh, around February. He got saved, and, and I've had the privilege and honor to kind of walk with him, and I did have his permission to share this story, by the way. Uh, and, and so anyways, uh, he, he came, and uh, as you guys know, this summer, if you were part of Connect Church, we were having meals at everybody's houses, and so I invited Ray, Ray and his, his wife, Christy, over because they're like family to us. And, uh, and so we invited him over, and we we're like, hey, we want you all to be, be a part of this. And, and Ray's like, hey, bro, guess what? I can make carne asada. And he goes, I can make it better than La Popular. I was like, bro, better than La Popular? That's a statement, right? And I was like, okay, big dog, you come, come make it and see what, you, see what you got going on here. So anyways, he... He comes over, and, and I'm like, I'm a student trying to learn how to, how to make different types of food, right? So I was like, well, teach me how to make carne asada. So anyways, he's, he's, we're, we're making it, and he's, he's got this thing of chili powder, right? He pours it in, and it's like the whole thing. And I was like, that's a lot of chili powder. And then he cracks open another chili powder, and then he pours in like half of it. And then he's got this little smirk. He looks at me, and he's like, boop. And he, he, dumps, he, dumps, the, he dumps the whole thing in, and I'm like, 
I'm just thinking like quietly to myself, well, I've never made carne asada, so maybe that's, that's not too much. And I took a bite of that thing. And I was like, whoa, it's like someone kicked you in the face with chili powder. Like I was just like chili powder is coming out of my nose. It's on my shirt. It smelled at my house for three weeks. It was all over the place, right? And, and so to his credit, he saved it and he brought that, that, that chili uh, flavor down and brought it back down to a place to where we could actually eat it. And it was, it was good. And, and people were like, hey, it was a good, good meal. I think everyone was trying to be nice. who came over to the house that night, uh, just to be honest with you. But anyways, this bothered Ray so much. And I used to pick on him because I was like, hey, what's up, chili powder? And like, you know, we just messed with each other the whole time over the last several months because of that one incident, right? And so like three weeks ago, he calls me. He's like, Roger, please, like, hey, I want to make, I want to make our inside again. And then I want to bring it over to your family. And let me do it right this time. And so just to, to his credit, he came back and redeemed himself and did a phenomenal job making carne inside it. But I share that story with you because like, you know, we don't have to be monks in a monastery to be living for God with all of our heart. We can have a good time together. We can crack up and have fellowship and enjoy life together. It's it's about expressing those things. And the third thing that they did really well, the early church, uh, they they were concerned about the spiritual needs of others around them because it was talking about we we pray. And so it's it's just like when you hear people's struggles and it's like, well, man, that sucks. I mean, that's the world, right? Well, hopefully, hopefully things will get figured out for you. But no, as, as, as the body of Christ, as a church, we pray for one another. We encourage each other. And so it's imperative that we find a group of people that we love, that really love God and really love us. And so second one is this, healthy life-giving churches cultivate genuine fellowship. They cultivate genuine fellowship. Acts 2, 43, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and the signs performed by the apostles and and, and signs performed by the apostles. In verse 43, we see this this idea of the awe factor is what I call it. And And it's present in the early church. And remember I told you number two was one of the things I was missing that God started putting back together in my life was this fear of God. And so uh, we can define awe as this overwhelming uh, feeling of fearful wonder, right? Not like a, oh my gosh, she's going to kill me, but like just like looking into a fire and watching it, you know, there's a respect you have for it, but at the same time, it's like it compels you in, right? Uh, And it's, it's this fearful wonder that we have. And so that fearful wonder ties into a healthy view of a holy God that we have to have. When God's people have a healthy fear of God, this is what happens. They long for the presence of God. Their, uh, their desire, uh, they desire uh, leads to obedience to God's word and what he commands them to. They understand what is hanging in the balance, which is souls, right? And God's mission all of a sudden starts becoming their mission. And if you notice, what accompanied the awe of God's people in that, in that verse was signs and wonders. When, God, when God's people walk in a holy fear, this allows God to show up in miraculous ways because he is with them. He is with them. And as a church, we should believe in God for the miraculous, for people to be set free, for lives to be transformed, for, for physical healing, believing in God's provisions and his blessings. And it's important to note this, that uh, God is not a genie in a bottle wanting to grant wishes, but he is a good father who loves and delights to provide and take care of his children's needs. It's important that we see that we don't chase the miracles, but we chase the miracle maker, who is God. Unfortunately, there is a negative view uh, about this idea of miracles because of a few bad apples in the bunch, right? People, people abusing this, this, this healing gift and, and stuff like that. But the church, church we cannot let the enemy sour uh, the move of God. We cannot. This is how the enemy works. He takes something holy and purposeful and tries to smear negativity on it. So we want to stay far away from that as far as we can, as, as best we can. Or he tries to whisper to us individually. He says things like this, that's just weird. Stay away from that. It's just crazy, right? Or there's a scientific way of explaining that. Like when there's miracles that happen around us because it's for God's glory. The enemy tries to confuse us on those things. He does not want us to tap into the power that God has for us. He wants us to stay away uh, from the presence of God because Satan understands this, my friends, that if whatever happens when we become fully engaged followers of Christ, we will start taking back territory for the kingdom of God. And the enemy does not want to see the church to be successful in that. And, you know, I just, it just, it kills me to see that. 
God also uses the miraculous to demonstrate his power to those who are far from him, to draw them near, to say, I am real. He answers prayers that are like, I don't know how God did that. And, and it's just, it's amazing. And regardless of your previous stance on signs and wonders, let me point it to your attention a couple of things. Jesus performed miracles, and a lot of them. His disciples and his people performed miracles. We see so many recordings in the Old Testament and the New Testament of miracles that it's just unbelievable. I can't even count how many there are. Um, I have seen miracles in my own life. I've seen God's hands provision to protect my kids just in a way that's unexplainable. I've seen God provide in such a way for not only myself, but for those around me that I have no way of explaining how that happened. Like, miracles are part of it, and, and it pains me to think that rationale or prejudices that we hold to, to the wonders of God are just excused by so many believers nowadays. It's plainly unbiblical to deny signs and wonders or rationale them away, right? God provides miracles as an expression of his love to us. He, he, he also wants to show us his provisions and how he's going to take care of us. It's a very good thing to believe in miracles, friends, and, and ask the Father for them. And so a healthy, life-giving church fears God and believes God for the impossible. Acts 2.44 says this, all believers were gathered together and had everything in common. Uh, because we hit on this already, this is talking about unity. The only thing I'm going to point out on this is that they were unified and they were like-minded is what you're seeing here. And so a healthy, life-giving church, churches are unified by one spirit and one mind. And let's go to verse 45 real quick. Uh, verse 45 says this, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. The early church was generous in how they lived their life. They fed those who were hungry. They clothed those who were in need, right? And they provided spiritual healing and help. The early church was in a place, uh, place of selfless individuals. They placed people above themselves. People look through the lens of Christ, meaning they see people how God sees them. And as an early, early church and as a church nowadays, we should be a people that want to bless and help those around us. And this is something that I've seen in Pastor Adam uh, from day one. As a man who has a generous heart, he leads with generosity. I'm glad that we're a church that is very generous. And so uh, this goes to the next point. Healthy, life-giving churches are marked by generosity. They're marked by generosity. Acts 2, 46 says this, every day they continued to meet together in the temple. If you read this passage and take a pause real quick, you'll notice uh, one thing kind of sticks out to you. Every day? <laughs> every day they met? That's some commitment, guys. That's a whole nother level of commitment. It's hard to get somebody in here in one, one Sunday a month, right? Like our culture is like, ah, I'm sleeping in this morning. Cowboys are playing at noon. Can't miss that one, right? Uh, they're going to lose anyways, guys. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. I, I, love, I love Dallas Cowboys. I'm a Cowboys fan, okay? It's no hatred here, all right? But, but, you know, every day they continue to meet together. And friends, the early church committed to the spiritual rhythms of life. They were committed to spiritual rhythms of their life. This is real interesting. Pew Research Center did a study on church attendance uh, recently, and uh, they interviewed a lot of Christians. Get this, and I'm going to have to zoom this up real quick on my iPad here, but um, 30, okay, so they, they had three different categories. This is, they attended once a week, all right? This is of all Christians. These are not just non-Christians. These are all Christians. 36%, 36% of all American church, uh, Christians attended church at least once a week. Now, this is crazy. Uh, next is they attended once or twice or a few times a year. So 33%, 33% uh, attended once or twice a month or a few times a year. And then get this, 30% of the body of Christ seldom or never attend in church. And guys, as you guys already heard us talk about a few times on announcements, we got a series coming up called Church Hurt. Can I tell you that I think about 63% fall into that bucket because of some type of church hurt in their life. A big portion of that. And guys, we, we got to start changing that momentum. But, but the problem is, is like for us, it's just going to a church and it's just like, well, you know, it's really, really not doing anything for me. It's just like, but are you pressing in with everything you got inside of you? Are you really seeing what scripture's saying? There's important, there, the early church understood the importance of gathering together in worship. Meeting together does a couple of things, individually and collectively. First of all, it encourages our souls as believers. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the, the day approaching. Again, this Christian life isn't meant to be walked alone. 
God didn't design us to be in isolation. He's called us to be part of a family. You know, like you guys seen those RV commercials? You're part of the family, right? Like, I mean, like that's, but, but the reality is like, that's what we're trying to create here at Connect Church. We really want to get to know you. We really want to lock arms with you. It's not like the superficial, like, hey, I'm a professional Christian. I don't want to talk to you today. Like, or we're good today. Like, man, we want to, we want to get in the thick of it with you. We want to pray with you. We want to believe God in your, in your life. Because let me tell you, you have a purpose and there's a reason you are here. It is not just to like, ah, you know, church is kind of like, ah, I don't know. Right? We have to do that. Uh, secondly, it keeps us focused on the heart of God and the mission that he's called us to. And then thirdly, it gives us the opportunity to equip the church for the works of ministry. Ephesians 4.12, we talked about that previously. So healthy, life-giving church values gathering together. And then uh, we, got, we got two more and we're done here. Acts 2.46 says this, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. We see that the early church was filled, no pun intended, with an attitude of gratitude. This was an express, uh, it it came out in the the way they expressed to God, the way they loved God. It came out towards uh, how they viewed people, right? The goodwill towards all men. Our attitudes set the tone on how we interact with God and how we interact with people and how we even love ourselves at times. Because sometimes we could be our worst critic and we could beat ourselves up and put us into a corner where the enemy starts convincing us we're worthless, right? You're not worthless, like, but, but if we have that attitude of gratitude of what God has done on that cross and we see a clear picture of it, it it's life-changing and it helps to change those people around us, right? Um, uh, I heard it once say that you might be the only Bible people ever read. You might be the only Bible people ever read. In a world that is filled with hate and darkness, the church should be a refreshing wave of love and joy and mercy and grace and and just contagious to those in darkness. It is a light in dark places that you're shining so bright that they're only compelled to come to you because they're like, what's up with that? There's something different. And this is what the early church demonstrated. They saw this, those around them, uh, they they saw that. And, uh, And so... If we walk with love and gratitude, even the coldest hearts can be moved, guys. Even the coldest hearts can move. That's why I believe in verse 46, it said that they had favor of all people. They had favor of all people. Even though people didn't respect them, even though there was persecution taking place, they had favor with people. And I think they had favor because of the way they walked and demonstrated their lives. Because God wasn't just a fictional character. He wasn't just a nice thought. He was reality in their lives. And so a healthy, life-giving church has a contagious attitude of gratitude. And then lastly, this is... My favorite part, uh, to be honest with you, it's uh, Acts 2.47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. This verse right here is why I'm excited about being at Connect Church. Uh, Everything we have talked about to this point, can I tell you, I think we're doing these things really well at Connect Church. We are, we are seeing these, these healthy, life-giving churches, examples really living out, being demonstrated in our lives. And everything we talked about, I, I, really, do, I really do feel like that's what's happening right now. And verse 47 is the reward to the faithful churches. It's a reward to us. And what that reward is is that God increases those who were being saved. God starts bringing in the harvest. We start seeing life transformation, and we start seeing God do amazing things. But we must be prepared for the harvest. God is looking for a movement of people who are faithful to him and looking uh, for a group of people to trust with these souls that he's he's entrusting us souls. These, these are people, they're lives, they're real. They have emotions, they have feelings. And he's saying, I trust you with that. I'm gonna trust you with that because I see how you're living for me. And I see your faithfulness as, a, as the body of Christ, individually, collectively coming together, honoring me, loving me, wanting to see my mission move forward. And when God sees that, he's like, I'm gonna bless. I'm gonna bless them. And since this is the Lord's church in the first place and it's his health and, and it's his ministry, it's the one, it's God who's the one who draws in each individual for his glory. So we see God who provides the increase for us. And guys, this is the last point. Healthy life-giving churches are, expect, are expecting the harvest. They're expecting the harvest. We must ask ourselves, do we collectively, do we desire a move of God that we're willing to do these three things? Understand our roles and responsibilities. We collectively lead with a servant's heart and promotes unity that kills jealousy, gossip, and personal offense. And then number three, are we willing to follow the biblical model of a healthy church? And if we do that, guys, it's game over. This facility won't hold what God's gonna do. Like, we're gonna have to be like, okay, God, like, we're gonna have to go to three services. Like, 
And, and, and guys, it's not to, to let, me, let me share this with you. To see that happen is not about our personal pride. Like, look what we did at our church. It's like, guys, don't we want to see the lost saved? Aren't we going to get serious about it? Don't we want to see God move in our lives? Don't you want to, are you tired of getting your butt kicked in life? I mean, in all seriousness? Like, and all, oh God, God's saying, just give me all your heart. My way's better than your ways. You've already tried to figure it out for the last 35 years. You're not working, it's not working really well. Come to me, let me have your life and let me show you what I'm gonna do. And so this morning, I'm gonna have the worship team come back up and I want us collectively to lift up a song uh, to the Lord. But before I do that, I always wanna give a moment to where we could uh, you know, ask uh, if anybody has, wants to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And so if you wouldn't mind, just bow your heads for me real quick. And, uh, and close your eyes. Um, and and if, you're, if you came here today, and I know this message was talking about the church, but maybe you said, hey, Roger, the one thing I haven't given over, my, my, uh, given over to God was my own life. And maybe that's for you this morning. And if that's you, could you raise your hand this morning? No one's looking. They just wanna, just wanna see a hand raised. If anybody, has, uh, if anybody wants to accept Jesus Christ, his personal Lord and Savior, he'll change your life. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. All right, you guys can go ahead and open your eyes and lift up your heads. Um, if you raise your hand this morning, why don't you come meet me out in the back over here and we'll, uh, we'll talk and I'd love to kind of help you with next steps. But we're gonna go ahead and step into the time of worship now and then Pastor Alan will come out and close us after that. So thank you, guys. <laughs>